Most of us consider real estate as the holy grail of investing. And rightfully so, it's probably the most rewarding. Done right, it's probably the most enriching. But I've often wondered, is it really as great as it's made out to be? This is what we'll look to cover in this video. We are again crunching the numbers. On one hand, I will share with you my real estate investment, which is this place we have right here. I've been paying for this in the last 10 years. And we'll be exploring the scenario, what if I had put in the investment money for the condominium into an S&P 500 fund? The results are actually interesting. So enough with this intro and let's go. But before anything, if you are new to this channel, hi, I'm Mark. It's nice to meet you. In this channel, I cover a bit about lifestyle, but in most, you talk about business and investments. Specifically, I've also done a number of videos about being an Airbnb host. So this would be somehow relevant to our talk today about real estate investments. So I've been paying for this place in the last 10 years, the first three years of which was the pre-selling period. And after the down payment period, the unit was turned over to me after I had secured a housing loan or a mortgage. So the loan that I took was over the course of 15 years. Currently, I am on my seventh year. Unfortunately, still a long way to go. But the good thing about this property is that since I've bought it, it's more or less doubled already. So that's what I'm actually trying to explore here. What if I sold my property right now and cash out? And we'll compare this with the scenario of me having placed the same amount in an S&P 500 fund in the last 10 years. A few weeks ago, I shared with you some number crunching that I did as I compared different S&P 500 funds and how it would have performed through different banks. Specifically, I compared BDO, East West Bank, RCBC, Metro Bank, and BPI who all have S&P 500 funds. So for this experiment, we'll be taking one of those banks I'll be using the one from RCBC and Metrobank, which have quite similar rates. So in that previous video, we were looking at investing as little as possible based on the bank's minimums. This time, we'll follow the same formula, but instead of putting in as little as possible at a time, we are actually putting in the amount that I've invested in this condo and putting it in the S&P 500 UITF. So that's just a bit of a primer. Let's now go into the computations and see how our funds would have performed. For the first three years during the down payment period, what I was putting in was 25,000 pesos per month. After this down payment period, what I was putting in averaged around 35,000 pesos per month. Again, I've been doing this in the last seven years. So in the same way, we'll be putting 25,000 pesos per month for the first three years. And after the third year, I'll be putting in the 35,000 pesos monthly. So the amount that I've invested over the course of those 10 years would be 3,764,472. By the way, just as a disclaimer, if you had put in your entire money at the start, which means you didn't need the loan, you probably don't need this video. I just wanted to give that small disclaimer that I'm approaching this as exactly as how I've invested in the condo. Of course, it would be a whole lot different if you have the money lying around and just easily invested. That would be a different computation altogether. So anyway, let's get back to this. After 10 years, my money in the S&P 500 would have amounted to 7,790,882 pesos. Factoring in the bank fees, for Metro Bank and RCBC, it's at 0.75% per annum. The resulting amount would be 7,564,649. So more or less, the top line return would be 207%. And after factoring in the fees, the amount is just a little over 200%. Now let's move for our computations for the condo. So again, I put in the same amount of money, a little over 3.7 million over the course of 10 years. Usually, the going rate for BGC would be between 250 to 300,000 pesos per square meter. I think that's actually too expensive. If I wanted to sell this place right now, I think it would realistically be under 250,000 per square meter. I think the going value of my property right now and which the market would be willing to buy is at 8.5 million pesos. So 8.5 million sounds good. That's more than a 200% return. But that's just the top line. We have to factor in a lot of costs, a lot of expenses that I've incurred over the years in maintaining this place. So if I sell this place for 8.5 million pesos, I have to pay capital gains of 6%. So that's 510,000 pesos that we deduct from the total price. 
aside from that, we have the RPT or the real property tax that's 49,000 pesos over the last seven years. Other expenses also include the association dues. Over the course of seven years, I've paid about 400,000 pesos, roughly under 5,000 pesos per month. And it doesn't stop there. We actually have larger computations that we have to factor in. So when this unit was turned over to me, it only had the sink and the toilet. So for me to be able to use or rent out the place, I actually spent for renovating it and buying new furniture, appliances, air conditioning, installation, so on and so forth. So seven years ago, I spent roughly 800,000 pesos on this. And lastly, since this place is still under a housing loan, I have to pay the bank my outstanding balance of 2.1 million pesos. So if 8.5 million is my selling price and deduct the real property tax every year, the capital gains tax, my association dues, renovation, and my outstanding loan, the resulting amount that I would actually pocket would be a little over 4.6 million. So if you are comparing right now to the effortless gains through the S&P 500, uh, it's quite low, uh, I have to admit to that. But of course, that's scenario number one. That actually assumes that I probably lived in this place and just paid for it monthly. So for condominiums such as this, you can opt to monetize it via Airbnb with short-term guests, or the other option you would have would be the more traditional long-term tenants, which is better. I've also done a video on that in the past, so check that out later. But anyway, let's assume that from your long-term tenants or from your Airbnbs, the property actually pays for itself, meaning that the 35,000 pesos that we're paying to the bank is actually being generated from the income from our tenants. So if we plug in the value of the rental income, that's an additional 2.9 million. So scenario number two, wherein I didn't use the place and monetized it through tenants on top of the 4.6 million that we would have gotten after all the deductions, the amount would be 7,589,900 pesos. So very similarly to the S&P 500, the returns are also around 201%. So which is the better investment? Well, that would really depend on you, on the goals that you have. You do a lot more work by investing in real estate, different things that you have to factor in. And it's surprising for me to see that having done all that, if you had just simply put it in the S&P 500, it would have resulted the same. And my position here is quite neutral. I'm not telling you to invest in the banks or UITFs and the S&P 500 completely. I think there are definitely pros and cons that we must consider. So one of the better things about putting it in an investment fund is that you have your funds within reach anytime you needed it. You can access your funds probably within a week or at most two weeks when you want to redeem it. I mean with real estate, when you want to part with your property, it's not as fast as that. If you can get a transaction within weeks, uh, that's actually good. Of course, you and the buyer will have to go through due diligence, uh, different things that you have to consider, security, safety. So it's not as easy to dispose of real estate. So that's actually one of the perks of investing in these investment funds. Other pros would include having the ability to include these funds whenever you need a bank statement. Uh, sometimes you need this to either go abroad. Uh, again, as Filipinos, we can't go anywhere without visas. So bank statements are very important. And one more perk of investing in these investment funds is that there's actually no pressure of what you need to invest. I mean, you don't have to pay as regularly as possible as you would for a banking loan that is anyway debt. I guess the downside is also you are not so religiously, regularly investing if it's so optional. So I guess that's a bit of a double-edged sword. And let's now go to the cons of investing in these UITFs. So when we invest in stocks or these funds that are managed by professionals, I think there tends to be a feeling that we are at the mercy of the market. Like we can't really do anything. All we can do is research. In the case of the S&P 500, this would reflect the performance of the top 500 US corporations. So in many ways, maybe we feel disconnected being so far from all that is happening. And in any way, we can't really do anything about it. So I guess that's one downside. We would have to have uh, more surrender to what's going on. And the other downside would be perhaps your lack of use of what we invested in. I mean, other than being in your bank statement, it's something that you can't really use. It's not something that you can show off or host guests in. Unlike real estate, which has a lot of utilitarian value. I mean, if you wanted to live there, if you wanted to have your friends over, to have a party, or if you're wiser with it, having tenants, 
in as much as you can't liquidate it as fast as you would with an investment fund, you do have a lot of uses for it. My example is specific only to a condominium because that's what I know. But if you had invested in another property, let's say you found a house or a building in either a commercial or residential area, you can have tenants in the form of stores or offices or as basic as having it as a boarding house. So there's a lot more flexibility. There's a lot more use. And again, if you wanted to monetize it, to utilize it in that way, you would have to put in more work, perhaps more renovation. And I guess one of the harder things when you invest in real estate is that, again, most of us get into real estate not having the outright cash to purchase a property, but we have to go through the process of a banking loan and more than just the application, it's maintaining and keeping, paying for that loan regularly that's hard. When you put in your money in an investment fund, I guess there's not much of a fixed commitment. It's not as big of a pressure, but when we invest in real estate, in property, you having to take on a loan, taking on debt for a good portion of your life can be quite stressful. So these are the things that you have to consider. So again, what's really better? Well, I have to admit that this is a comparison of apples to oranges. I mean, even if we are able to come up with a comparable value between real estate investing and in an investment fund, I think it's not an easy conclusion. Each real estate investment is different. There are worse investments, there are better investments. And I'm not talking about condominiums being inferior to other investments. I'm just letting you know that real estate per property can be different beasts. One of the main challenges though of condominium investing is that because of the many condominiums out there right now, I don't know if we are going to be facing the same type of appreciation in 10 years time. I actually feel fortunate that this property has doubled in value since investing. There are many condominiums all over the Philippines right now. I don't know if they will be subject to the same appreciation that I did witness here in BGC. I guess one more disclaimer would be that the S&P 500 is at an all-time high right now. So this comparison is actually somewhat of a best case scenario. Both the S&P 500 and property value of BGC are high. So it's a nice comparison, but this can all be very different when the markets are down for the S&P 500. And let's say that the Philippines undergoes a recession and property values go down, perhaps oversupply. Perhaps there's something that really affects the way our economy works. That will also result into a different scenario so again, I'm not biased nor pushing you to one investment over the other. My point here is to really open the discussion. Again, like I said, it's comparing apples to oranges, but they are still fruits. <laughs> they are both investments. They do have similarities. And these are things that you have to consider when investing these big amounts. I guess another angle that we can consider here would be these investments of mine are actually Average investor moves, I don't consider myself an expert, a professional in either real estate or these stocks and equities and mutual funds and UITFs. So I'm relaying these to you guys that you are probably going to be faced with the same predicament, the same choices. It seems that putting your money in an investment fund with it being hassle-free is quite advantageous. But again, there are a lot of perks that investing in real estate does offer as well. Um, what do you think? Does this change your mind about real estate investing? Knowing what we know now that investing in real estate and investing in an investment fund can in fact be comparable. What will you invest in? If you've liked this video, please don't forget to like, comment, and consider subscribing if you haven't already. Thanks again for watching guys and happy investing!